This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. You can find it in your pew Bible on pages uh, 862 and 863 if you'd like to follow along. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who had heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in a moment of silent reflection on the passage we have just heard? Amen. Superman had Clark Kent, a mild-mannered reporter with glasses. Because clearly, not a soul would recognize Superman if he put on a pair of horn-rimmed glasses. Brilliant disguise. <laughs> Wonder Woman had Diana Prince, who was working for the military, I think and also depended almost solely on a pair of glasses to mask her true identity. By the way, if I understand the mythology correctly, Diana was actually her Amazon name, so the prince part was the really clever addition. <laughs> Batman had Bruce Wayne, but this one's a little different because Bruce Wayne was Bruce Wayne before he was Batman, and he had a full mask, but he still felt it necessary to make his voice all gravelly, so no one would recognize that either. I'm Batman. <laughs> and then there was Hannah Montana, who had Miley Cyrus. <laughs> Similar to Batman, the alter ego was Hannah Montana, but the regular person was maintained to keep her grounded. And we see how well that worked out. <laughs> Why all this misdirection? I mean, would it be such a problem if Superman were just Superman 24-7? There was probably enough help needed in the fictional city of Metropolis and the surrounding alternate universe to keep him busy all the time. And he is Superman. It's not as if he was at somehow greater risk if someone found out his true identity. But then again, those whom he cared about would be at greater risk without some level of secrecy as we saw in the last couple of Superman movies. And what about Miley Cyrus? There's something to be said for being able to live the life of a superstar all the time, and also something to be said that is equally attractive to having a somewhat normal life at least part of the time. It must be tough sometimes to be the person that everyone wants a piece of, or the person that everyone counts on for help or salvation. Expectations can be difficult. 
The four Gospels in the Bible paint four different pictures of the person we know as Jesus Christ. And they do so for very intentional reasons. For as you know, the literature form into which the Gospels fall is that of ancient biography. Now, ancient biographies, unlike biographies of today, are not intended to be or purported to be strictly factual accounts of the life of their subject. Instead, they were written with the purpose of conveying a particular character of that subject. Said another way, the four Gospels are different because the four writers wanted to convey a very specific understanding of who Jesus was. At a very basic level, each tells the story of how Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. But the impact of that identity is different for each, and as a result, their tellings differ. Among the four, the two accounts that are most unlike each other are the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John. These two accounts differ in many ways, from their length, Mark being the shortest and John being the longest, their style, Mark being the most direct and to the point, and John the most poetic. And in the way they initially approach the identity of Jesus, Mark, who attempts to convey a sense of mystery, and John, who just puts it right out there from the very beginning. Much like the four characters I spoke of at the start of this sermon, Mark attempts to mask the true identity of Jesus. In that gospel, this is known as the Messianic Secret. As you read through Mark's gospel, you come across many instances when someone has, that Jesus has healed, or a demon, or even sometimes the disciples correctly assert that Jesus is the Messiah, and the very next thing that Jesus says is, shh, don't tell anyone. And in the case, as in the cases of Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, and Hannah Montana, this is done for a number of reasons. If it were known that Jesus was the Messiah, he would be unable to move about to the country without attracting too much attention. If it were known that Jesus was the Messiah, the leaders, both civil and religious, would come after him. This will, of course, happen, but there is a hope that such attention might be delayed. If it were known that Jesus were the Messiah, people would expect him to take his place as the military leader they expected to come and deliver them from the Roman oppression. And simply speaking, that is not the kind of Messiah that Jesus has come to be. As I said, there are a number of good reasons to maintain the messianic secret as we consider the overall plan of God as it is put forth in Mark's gospel account. But then there is the gospel of John. How does such an idea play in that account? Messianic secret? Nope. It is pretty clear from the very beginning of John's writing that he has no interest in keeping the identity of Jesus a secret. No one is told to shh. No one is asked to keep quiet. There is no place for Clark Kent or Bruce Wayne or Diana Prince for that matter. Right away in the very first chapter, John the Baptist spills the beans. He saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away sin from the world. And later, he says, I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. All right, then. There it is. No point in trying to keep the secret now. And if that weren't enough publicity, the very next passage relates that Andrew goes off and tells Simon Peter that we have found the Messiah. The secret is out. And this trend stays pretty consistent throughout the Gospel of John, as Jesus, portrayed by Mark, asking those he encounters to place their focus on God's work and not his messianic identity, goes forth, according to John, boldly embracing his Christic role through declaration and demonstration. John's is not a shy Jesus. Having an older brother named John and being a Mark myself, it is rare that you will hear me say this. But on this occasion, as it relates to how we approach the subject, I think John is right. <laughs> you will never hear me say that again. <laughs> we have much to learn from John in how we engage the world about our faith and the man that Jesus was and the living Christ present and active in the world in our day. 
For you see, far too often I think we tend toward Mark's initial approach, and we shy away from expressing the beliefs embedded in our faith. We bow to the secular conventions of the world that surround us and in which we move, and we refrain from owning our Christian faith. Or we misunderstand what it means to engage in interfaith dialogue, and we forget to share our faith story at the table where we hope to hear the stories of others so that all might be enriched. My friends, far too often we keep the messianic secret, and that is not what we are called to do. I have heard several times since my arrival here at Manhattan Beach Community Church that this has been the church of the quiet faith. Well, as we approach the time of our annual meeting in a few weeks, and as we begin to discern our ministry, you and I, together, I would like to respectfully challenge that assertion. For if we intend to fulfill our call as a Christian community and an expression of the living body of Christ in this community and this world, we cannot afford to keep quiet. If we hope to embody the sense of Christ-like welcome we declare at the beginning of each service when we say, no matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, we cannot keep the message to ourselves. If we believe that there is true and meaningful ministry that we are called to do in this world, we cannot sit back and wait for others to stumble across our threshold. You may have figured it out, but yes, my friends, I am talking about one of those words that we as progressive Christians tend to misunderstand or simply set aside. I am talking about evangelism. Okay. I said it. Now it's out there and we can all take a deep breath. Everyone good? Like many words in our Christian lexicon, evangelism has been hijacked by those whose motives and methods are far different from our own. I suspect that when I said the word evangelism, there's a good chance that you pictured the street preacher shaking his Bible in the air condemning all passers-by as sinners in need of repentance. By the way, repentance is another word that we will someday unpack right here, but not today. Or you might have pictured the televangelists preaching the prosperity gospel, or tearfully begging forgiveness for their own sins, or inexplicably blaming the latest natural disaster on what they have deemed sinful behavior simultaneously demonstrating a very limited understanding of grace and meteorology. <laughs> Far too often, we understand evangelism as a form of conversion, as shoving our beliefs down the throats of another, rather than embracing it as a process of simply telling our story, our story of our faith, and sharing how our faith has enriched our lives, offering us a sense of belonging, a sense of comfort, and a sense of purpose. Madeline Lengel said, we do not draw people to Christ by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are. We do so by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Rather than the heavy-handed images we might conjure, what about illustrations of true evangelism? that take the form of open-minded interfaith dialogue when we come together to share the stories of our faith and the impact of that faith on our lives, where we both share and listen with open ears and open hearts. But what about acts of service in and for the community or those in need in our community or the simple and compassionate act of invitation to one who is seeking or one who is hurting and in need of a sense of community based in faith. The faith we share is not one that we are meant to keep to ourselves, my friends. It is not a faith that we pull off the shelf each Sunday or every other Sunday when we come for worship. It is not a faith that is simply informed by an hour in this sanctuary. The faith we share is one that is informed by our whole lives by the interactions we experience each day in the many, many settings of our days and nights. And the faith we share is meant to be shared through our words and our deeds as we model the acceptance, inclusion, and love of Christ. 
You are not simply a Christian on Sunday or a Christian at church. You are always a Christian. You are not called to embrace your faith only in your thoughts, but in your words and in your deeds as well. Our evangelism is an act of living as Christ calls us to live. There are many reasons for it, I am sure, but far too often in relation to our faith, we act as if we are keeping a secret. We walk around in our Diana Prince or Clark Kent glasses. We put on our masks or our wigs that serve to protect our true identities, saving ourselves for Sunday. We passively accept the negative and damaging images of Christians and seek to be the people of the quiet faith. Nope. Now is the time to reclaim the faith that has shaped us, the faith that has offered us hope and meaning. Now is the time to take off the disguise, open our mouths, and proclaim the good news of Christ. Amen.